Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, as you are at work within us and at work in the world around us, may we always notice and rejoice where we see your work bearing fruit. Amen. Reading this uh, kind of shorter version of the parable of the sower, which occurs in a somewhat longer form in Matthew and Luke, where Jesus goes into more detail about, you know, the different kinds of ground that the seed falls upon. and kind of makes a different point out of it. He may have told this parable more than once to make more than one point. I mean, a good story is worth reusing. But encountering this parable of the sower again, it made me think about a, a home haggler practice, which we engage in, which we refer to now as yellow thumb gardening. It used to be brown thumb gardening, but we've gotten a little bit better at it, so now it's yellow thumb gardening. It's a long way from green thumb to yellow thumb. This practice began when we moved into the place where we've lived for the past 10 years. And uh, we had some space out front. It's a rental, but there's some space out front and in the back where you can grow things if you want. And um, rather than pick like some orderly, orderly shrubbery, uh, we would just get like seed packets and open them and just kind of throw them on the ground. Sort of in like an awkward Darwinism, like let's see who wins, right? Let's, Throw all the seeds on there, and then we'll find out what happens. And so we'd notice, oh, some of the seeds are sprouting. I wonder what they're going to be. <laughs> and we watched them sprout and grow and bloom, and it was pretty pleasing. And so then, uh, I forget which winter this was, but it was early in our time here. We, uh, Pam rediscovered, and I discovered the wonder of Ots. Have you been to Ots? Yeah, Ots is this beautiful historical greenhouse, and it's especially wonder, it's, it's huge. It has an interior of waterfall. It has like a little pond, koi pond, like it's, it's gorgeous. It's especially nice in winter. You go to Ots in winter, and outside it's like 20 degrees, and inside it's like 75 degrees and humid, and you just wander around all this lush greenery. And so we would go to Ots, and we would just buy whatever plants we thought looked cool or thought looked interesting. And if the plant is a succulent, then it goes on the windowsill in the kitchen. So we have like a row of hardy succulents that have survived yellow thumb gardening for years. And then for the plants that weren't succulents, we would dig a hole out front, stick the plant in the hole, cover it over so it looks nice, and then just see what happens. And obviously some will flourish and some will not. And then as time went on, we noticed some things. Like we had a bunch of surprises. Like we had annuals that were perennials. And we had perennials that came back annually. And we had, we had, we had flowers coming up. We don't know what they are or where they came from. We have flowers coming up and plants coming up we didn't plant. We think maybe squirrels or birds were responsible. And I'm not saying this because we're skilled gardeners or because we've hit upon like a, an incredible life hack for, for gardening. I mention this because we aren't very skilled gardeners, and that makes us very similar to the sower from this story. And we enjoy our surprises. We enjoy the fact that the, the remains from our pumpkins, our Halloween pumpkins, uh, are now sort of colonizing our neighbor's area. <laughs> There's little trailers that are heading under the bushes, and, and like our neighbor might get some pumpkins if you want some pumpkins. <laughs> We're going to get some pumpkins too. We don't know what kind. Watching little flowers bloom. We have sunflowers that no matter how many times our HOA kills them, they always come back. And we just, you know what, hey, this is the sunflower, this is between you and the sunflowers. We're not going to intervene, you know. If the sunflowers win, then good for them. Um, we're just going to watch them grow and enjoy them. 
even when they get, you know, 13 feet tall, and we're not sure why. In our backyard, we have this beautiful bleeding heart plant that we did plant, but growing up out of the center of our bleeding heart plant is a tree. And it's not even the first tree. It's the third tree that has grown up out of the center of our bleeding heart plant. And we have tried pruning the tree, and then we tried cutting everything off the tree and just leaving like just a, just a, a trunk. And we've tried cutting the tree off with an ax. And the tree or a similar tree continually returns and keeps growing up and emerging out of our bleeding heart bush. I suspect our dog Patches likes to bury toys under that bush. And I suspect that some squirrel has also come under and like buried a cache of nuts under that bush. And so now like when we cut down one tree, a new nut you know, sort of sprouts. But it's, it's like reincarnation. It's incredible. We have tried to get rid of the tree and it keeps coming back. And again, I don't say this because I think we're making incredibly smart decisions about gardening. We're having a good time. It is what it is. It's yellow thumb gardening. But like the sower in the story, we're not being very careful about how we garden. We're not really concerned about how it's going to turn out or a return on investment. We're just, we're like the, the sower, just scattering seed wherever. And then looking at it and saying, huh. I wonder why it grew. I don't, I don't know. The parable that follows this story, which I cut just for simplicity. We already have multiple themes in this service. I didn't need more. But the parable that follows this parable of the sower is the parable of the mustard seed. A familiar parable for most of us probably. Jesus talks about the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, but when you plant it, it grows into this enormous tree, and birds can perch in the branches of the tree, and it can provide shade. And that parable is not about a normal mustard plant. The mustard plant grows to be maybe six feet tall. It's a bush. It's not a tree. Its branches won't hold up birds unless they're very, very small birds. It won't give much shade at all. The parable of the mustard seed is about an absurd mustard plant that breaks the normal rules of a mustard plant. That if you saw it, you'd be shocked. You'd be like, what is going on with this massive mustard plant with birds nesting in its branches and people living in its shade? That's, that's irrational. That's wild. And the parable of the sower connects with that because this sower is not a good sower. Like, if this is a farmer, they're not a good farmer. They're going to starve. If this is a gardener, they're not a good gardener. They're going to be surprised by what comes up. Like, I have friends who are very good gardeners. They are not surprised by what grows in their garden. They put a lot of planning into it, and they get what they planned for, for the most part. But this sower is just like, oh, oh look at that, it grew. Look at that, it didn't. Wild. As a sower, as a farmer, as a gardener, you're responsible for choosing the right soil, for preparing the soil beforehand, for caring for the soil while things grow from it. This sower is kind of a doofus, just throwing seed all over, wasteful, careless. And we have this sower as an image of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is not a skilled and efficient sower any more than the kingdom of God is a normal mustard plant. If the kingdom of God was normal, if it was business as usual, if it was a collection of common sense best practices, there would be no reason to talk about it. There would be no purpose for Jesus to have existed. There would be no point for the Bible. If you could arrive in the kingdom of God by just 
doing the thing that makes the most sense, doing the thing that gives you the best return on your investment of time and energy, this would all be a waste of time. I could be doing something else. But God, the way that God gives seems to be unconcerned with any return on investment. The way that God gives seems to be with absolutely no concern for what God gets back. Because God will give blessings to a person who won't give anything back. And God will sow in ground that will never bear fruit and nothing will sprout from it. And the sower, I think, is supposed to reflect God. And it's not yet a reflection of us, but maybe should be. Obviously, obviously this is uh, Father's Day. This is also a day when our community is hosting its Juneteenth celebration. Uh, which, again, I'll be doing the blessing to open it up at 2 o'clock. And uh, it's pretty fun. If you have time, um, come check it out. A lot of people have put a lot of work into it. Last year it was cool. I met a, uh, a DJ therapist, um, which was a first. And it was great to talk to. Um, we <laughs> traded <laughs> business cards and talked about the weird things that we try to combine <laughs> together in our jobs. For a long time, Juneteenth was kind of a, a celebration in the black community. And then sort of recently, white people have discovered Juneteenth or rediscovered it, and it became our newest federal holiday in 2021. The first one since Martin Luther King Day in like the early 80s. And so a brief history, a very brief history of Juneteenth for those of you who maybe don't know why it's a holiday, like what's going on. Uh, Terry read the proclamation that is at the heart of the Juneteenth celebration. What happened was uh, the, the Confederacy lost the Civil War, and so the Emancipation Proclamation had to be sort of imposed on the South. And there were a lot of holdouts. There were a lot of communities of people where they knew they'd lost the war, and they knew there was an Emancipation Proclamation in effect, but they didn't tell the enslaved people working for them. They wanted to get like the last few months or years of work out of them. And so the United States military had to send people throughout the country to make these public proclamations so that slave owners couldn't avoid the fact that they no longer owned any human beings, that it was now illegal. And so to the people hearing this announcement in Texas in 1865, they were like, what? No one has told us this because we're not allowed to learn how to read and, you know, we don't get news. But you had to literally send the army to impose the Emancipation Proclamation. People didn't just agree. Oh, yeah, we were wrong. You're right. We should release all of our slaves. They had just fought a war to keep them. And so Juneteenth is a celebration of this as the last of these proclamations that went throughout the country. This was the last one. And it went to Texas, and you read it uh, as I read it last year at the Juneteenth celebration. I don't know about you, my experience of reading it was very mixed. Like, you say in the beginning, it's a proclamation, all slaves are free, and everyone cheers. And then you say that you, it's absolute equality of rights, and people are like, yeah, cool. And then you say... You will not be supported in idleness, and you will not gather at military stations, and you must stay where you must stay put where you are. And that's the end of the proclamation. And everyone's like, "Yeah, thanks, cool. Let's start the celebration now." So this year I get to do the blessing, which I much prefer. <laughs> Someone else can do the reading, and I appreciate that you did it this morning. But even the Emancipation Proclamation, even the Juneteenth Proclamation didn't actually free all of the slaves at the time. There were still slaves in a couple of U.S. states and in U.S. territories. And we talked about that, or I, I wrote about that a bit in the call to worship. Mm -hmm. 
we are still far from free. We are still a long way from a society where everyone is equal. We're closer than we were in 1865. That's for sure. But we are not there yet so many generations after. And sometimes I think about why, why does it take so long? Like I get having to have emancipation forced on you if you and your neighbors just fought a war against it, right? But what about 10 generations after that? Could we have figured this out? And I thought about one of the reasons why justice is so long delayed and denied is that we often look at it looking at the return on investment. We want to be prudent. We want to test the soil first. We want to make sure that if we do the right thing, if we enact justice, it'll give us what we're looking for. It'll bear the fruit that we want. And the result of that so often is simply delay. Let's think about it. Let's work on it. Be patient. Not yet. And you see this all over the place. Like, people are in theory happy to know there's affordable housing in the town where they live. But they don't want it in their backyard. People are happy in theory for diverse people to move to their neighborhood as long as their property values don't go down. People might be happy to move to a mixed neighborhood, a diverse neighborhood, but they're not going to send their kids to the public school down the street. We're aware that our justice system is wildly unequal, that prisons are full of people of color who are the minority everywhere but in prison. But we can't just let them out. They're criminals, right? And so we get to a situation that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about where the greatest enemies that he experienced between him and the dream that he had, the greatest opposition he found was from moderate white people who didn't hate him, didn't necessarily sick dogs on him or spray him with water hoses, but they just said, wait, slow down, hold on. We need to really think this through. Look at the impact of equality. What's going to happen? Be patient. Maybe righteousness is not supposed to be like that. Maybe that's not how justice is supposed to work. Maybe we have reaped so little after so long because we have sowed so little. Maybe the kingdom of God is a place where we do all the good that we can, when and where we can, without any concern for the return on investment. What we're going to get out of it. How it's going to help us. Maybe we're supposed to sow justice and equality like the sower. Just toss it everywhere. See what grows out of it. I think we forget that God is good to us with no concern for the cost. With no thought of what is God going to get back for all the good things God gives us. I think we forget that we can do no less than that for one another if we're going to live in the kingdom of God. Amen.